Hello, lovely listeners, and welcome back to season one, episode ten of Milk and Bookies, the poorly titled but hopefully less poorly produced podcast about all of your favorite novels and stories. Today is February tenth, and the time is one fifty nine p.m. Snowfall is upon Vancouver, so I wish upon you all a safe but snowy season. My name is Cheryl. I'm your tired but tenacious host, and I'm so glad that you're joining us today. Speaking of undesirable conditions and the excruciating cold. The content of today's episode deals a lot with similarly chilling ideas like dystopian societies and authoritarian regimes. The topic of today's discussion is "We" by Yevgeny Zamyatin, a lesser-known but extremely eloquent novel that scrutinizes a society we don't inhabit, but whose characteristics ring true in so many aspects of today. If you haven't read the book, I highly suggest you do. It can be a bit hard to follow at times, but contains some genuinely thought-provoking philosophies that may sound absurd to begin with, but slowly begin to unravel into principles that you'd be surprised you begin to believe. For the time being, here's a quick summary of what takes place. Spoiler alert: We takes place in one state, a segregated city that has blocked out all nature, is built of almost exclusively glass infrastructure, and has one supreme ruler called the benefactor that executes citizens on the regular. <gasps> Sex, love, education, free time, and art are all state property. Everything being mandated by the government. All citizens only receive two hours of personal time a day, during which they can let down the blinds and have some privacy in their glass city. Then we meet our characters, who are all named a combination of letters and numbers instead of literal names. The main protagonist is a man named D five zero three, who is the head engineer of the Integral, which is a spacecraft that one state is sending into space to conquer extraterrestrial beings. At the start of the book, he's registered or together with the short and slightly chubby woman named. O ninety, but eventually he ditches her for a sharp-witted and sharp-looking woman named I three thirty, who encourages him to partake in things he knows is wrong, and that's sort of the inciting incident of his revelations, <clears throat> as they you know fall in love and <clears throat> make love, mind you. Their romance expands into a gateway for transgression, rebellion, and discovery. D five zero three learns about the resistance group against the oppressive government and of the natural world outside one state before the rebel group, Mephi, is ultimately caught and brought down. As more people become conscious of the repression against them, the more chaotic one state becomes, and so the government removes their imagination, and the book is essentially left at that. And so it's a really complex book, so I thought that one of the best ways to unpackage its complexities was through exploring a theme. The theme I've chosen that I think is very prominent in the book is censorship. So, what is censorship? The dictionary definition of censorship by Oxford Dictionaries is the suppression or prohibition of any parts of books, films, news, etc. that are considered obscene, politically unacceptable, or a threat to security, which is a fine definition. But I think that you'll find in We, censorship is more so presenting information in a biased way, but under the pretense that it's impartial. For example, when D is recounting the lifestyle of his ancestors or us, he writes. I have read and heard many incredible things about the times when people still lived in a free, meaning unorganized and savage, condition. And what seems most incredible to me is that the state authority of that time could have allowed people to live without something similar to our table of hours, without obligatory walks, without exact regulation of meal times, getting up and going to bed whenever they felt like it. On the next page, D continues his totally unasked for rant, and writes, "Our one state science asserts that this was how the ancients lived, and our state science never errs." In this quotation, we see that one state doesn't necessarily withhold information, but instead only presents it with disdain and therefore not with neutrality. But they pretend they're being objective. I was reading a forum about this on social media, and they put it into words, saying. Unbiased journalism is not pretending both sides are equally valid. Unbiased journalism is reporting the facts, even if those facts include that one side is irredeemably awful. False neutrality is propaganda. In our case, false neutrality is a form of censorship. Furthermore, in we, 
Another prevalent form of censorship is the limitation of self-expression. We're talking limited private time, mandated sexual days, imagination bans, lacks of souls, state-oriented art instead of individual art, etc. In the case of we, the government provides the people a mold for them to fit into, and the only alternative to not conforming is death at the hands of the benefactor, a pretty unfair deal. Taking into account censorship as both limitation of true and accurate information, as well as limitation of self-expression, when I say censorship, what you can really interpret that as is indoctrination or brainwashing. But there's a lot to say about censorship and brainwashing and authoritarianism. So I thought, why not introduce a thematic statement to guide our discussion today? My thematic statement for this episode is... Censorship is only a problem when its subjects become aware of it. I've split my analysis into two main reasons as to why. The first of which is that ignorance is bliss. But before we delve into that, our first fun fact of the day. Did you know that We was the first book to be banned in the Soviet Union? Evgeny was a mastermind and boy did he know it. Back to ignorance is bliss. T-503 and most other civilians treat one state's propaganda as gospel in their minds, and you've really got to step in their shoes here. There is absolutely nothing incorrect or wrong about anything their government says, and in our perspective, this is pretty, uh, crazy. If the citizens are being controlled by the agenda of their government, yeah, we think that's a relatively big problem. But think from their perspective. If they can't fathom the idea that the government they've known and been conditioned to believe since birth could be spoon-feeding them wrong or immoral information, then they don't see a problem. Essentially, no. The civilians of one state can't find anything wrong with the obvious totalitarianism taking place because they don't know that anyone or anything is acting in a totalitarian way. No, the civilians of one state can't comprehend the extent of indoctrination they're under because that's all they've ever known, currently know, and probably will ever know. No, the civilians of one state can't register that they aren't free or living life to the full extent because if all else fails, they don't even have the access to the means to think beyond what they've been told. It's like parenting. My dad will buy my younger sister basically everything and... I'll pretend I'm not envious for the sake of this episode. But then that becomes what my sister expects of a parent. Her experience with her parent is going to set the standard for all of her future interactions with her own parents and other parents, as well as her perception of what defines a good parent. She doesn't recognize that she's a bit of a spoiled brat because she doesn't know any better and it's never crossed her mind that maybe the two most present people in her life might be dictating the way she's going to grow up, perhaps even negatively. Inhabitants really don't have much information besides what one state provides, and what could you do with great information anyway when you're always going to perceive it in the way you're told? I mean, just listen to this excerpt from Dee's journal at the beginning of the novel. The line of the one state is the straight line. It is the great, divine, exact, and wise straight line, the wisest of all lines. He continues to compare his journal, this very book, with a fetus within him. And for many months to come, it will require to be nourished with my own life, my own blood, until I tear it out painfully from myself and lay it at the feet of the one state. I mean, yikes, how brainwashed is that? And I think that the best, most indicative part of my statement, part of this quotation, is that he isn't simply expressing his emotions. He writes as if his words are inherently right. Listen to how happy D is with the current state of affairs. I'll have you know that on the page where my quotations were retrieved, there were nine exclamation points. For real. When I say D's happy, I mean he's ecstatic. Censorship isn't hurting him at all because he doesn't know that his belief system is biased. And he doesn't know that there are other alternatives because he's only exposed to and allowed to expose certain information and certain perceptions of that information. He will never hear a government official say that the life of the ancients may have been chaotic, but it was lively and fostered individuality, which is good because it advances society, der, der, der. And he will never be able to say the same without being crucified. So when a government like one state limits both the input and output of its inhabitants, it leaves no room for doubt 
no room for curiosity, no room for imagination, and thus no room for the very things necessary to fathom the possibility of censorship or fathom that your thoughts or morals are not your own. What I'm saying is that censorship, at its very core, takes away the things you need to break out of it. Therefore, citizens of one state are subjected to a cycle of ignorance. When I searched up what ignorance is bliss means, it read, if you do not know about something, you do not worry about it, and who oh boy has anything ever encompassed censorship so well. If you do not know about censorship and what it entails, you're going to be perfectly okay with the society you live in because you don't consider that your ideals might not be either your own or justified, period. Furthermore, if you cannot know about censorship, that is, the acts of censorship in themselves restrict your access to finding out about censorship, you won't worry about the seemingly absurd possibility that you might be a subject of it. Ladies and gentlemen, when it comes down to the harms that censorship inflicts, they're almost non-existent if you don't know or cannot know about censorship in and of itself because, dear, dear listeners, you won't be able to tell. Ignorance is bliss. And to close this main idea, another wonderful quote from our adorably ignorant protagonist, I love, and I am certain I can safely say, we love this sterile, immaculate sky. Now, this brings us to my second reason as to why censorship is only a problem when its subjects become aware of it. Curiosity killed the cat. I hope everyone is sincerely enjoying my proverb slash idiom themed analysis today. No, no, hold your applause. Okay, when censorship is essentially exposed, what becomes most obvious is the abrupt lack of something unknown, being devoid of the void, if you will. <laughs> a real knee slapper there. Um, the most intuitive thought one might have after realizing they've been living under censorship is, well, what's been forcibly omitted from my life? What have I been missing out on? What information could I have been receiving but didn't? How should I compensate for all the years I've been losing potential knowledge? All right, for example, imagine you're in sixth grade. You've got a best, best friend, BFFs, soulmates, eternal companions. One day, you accidentally walk in on your best, best, best friend talking with another classmate and you hear them say something along the lines of, make sure you don't tell my best friend this. They cannot know, absolutely not. Do whatever you can to make sure they have no clue about this crazy cool secret. Maybe even lie to them. They just cannot know. Pinky promise? Among your first reactions, one very immediate one is probably, well, what's the secret? That's exactly the type of feeling that suddenly being aware of censorship should elicit. And this is where things get problematic. Censorship is only a problem when its subjects are aware of it because they get curious. And as we all know, curiosity killed the cat. I would say there are two types of curiosity that could cause everything to go wrong and become a problem in the context of we. One, curiosity towards what is being hidden and why. And then two, curiosity towards a new path beyond the boundaries of what censorship was trying to achieve. And these two types of curiosity are both dangerous and cumbersome to the individual trying to fulfill them. Let's talk about each type separately. The first type is Wanting to know what is being censored and why, which is already grave in itself because curiosity, which directly relates to imagination and a man's pursuit of novelty, is denied under one state. This type of curiosity is embodied primarily by D503. I was searching for a quote to illustrate this, as one does, and I was astounded to say the least at how little I could find D rarely if ever, questions the righteousness and validity of one state, but arguably, his lack of such supports my case just as much. D, even in the most arduous of instances, clings on to one state like a child would their mother and erases any of his doubts as quickly as they come. Take Unanimity Day, when he began to question the stability of one state in his journal, writing, Is it possible that the sheltering age-old walls of the one state have toppled? Is it possible that we are once again without house or roof? In the wild state of freedom, like our distant ancestors? Is there indeed no benefactor? Then barely a page later, in a new entry, he writes, Oh, all wise, are we after all saved in spite of everything? Indeed, 
What objection can be raised to this most crystal clear of syllogisms? No, the walls are still intact. And there are so many more quotations to be made where D legitimately just praises one state and the benefactor. But either way, I think it's for this exact reason, the reason that D never stops to try and investigate the manipulative and controlling ways of state authority, even though he often gets the chance to, that the benefactor is so relatively leisurely with him. Instead of torturing and executing him like he did the rest of the rebels, D gets his imagination removed, and that's about it. Censorship wasn't ultimately a problem for him because he never was curious towards it, never really considered it, and never truly became aware of it or its consequences. He committed some pretty treacherous acts, like partaking in hijacking the Integral, but in the end, he isn't convicted nearly as harshly because he, unlike other Mephi members, never really grasped what he was fighting against, and that made all the difference. So, censorship is only a problem when its subjects become aware because their curiosity to learn more threatens the continuity of the censorship program and thus their safety. The second type of curiosity is wanting to pursue a new path, usually against the benefits of the government. This type of curiosity is much more prevalent in we, and its dangers are thus more thoroughly developed. It's the phenomenon when one recognizes what kind of citizen the government is trying to raise and promptly realizes that that is not the kind of citizen they want to be. It's understanding the brainwashing ways of censorship and the lifestyle or mentality that it's forcing onto you and wanting a different one. This type of curiosity is much more embodied in I-330 and in her endeavors with the rebel group Mephi. She's an insurgent from the get-go and we all know it. Check out this example of D quoting something she said during their time together, writing, You will never think of going to the Office of Guardians and reporting that I drink liquor, that I smoke. I'm even sure that in a moment you will drink this marvelous poison with me. I-330 is the epitome of revel if I ever knew one. She drinks, she smokes, she loves the ancient grandma, she colludes against the government, she spends time outside the green wall, she attempts to hijack the integral, but most impressingly of all, she gives away absolutely nothing when being questioned and tortured by the government. Her story differs from Dee's fundamentally in the way that where Dee doesn't understand what cause he's fighting for and why, I has understood it and to the point where she can use tactics she knows D will buy to help her in her conquest. Where D can't fathom anything wrong with one state, I knows very well and organizes a revolution against it. Where D is only participating in the rebellion for his love of I, I herself prioritizes victory against the state and reformation more than anything, even him. And that's the very problem. I-330 is constantly living and trying to find new ways of living outside the status quo, outside the prescribed lifestyle and mentality of one state, which is only possible because she can recognize censorship as an active constraint on her liberty. This relates directly to the idea of awareness, because to be able to register alternatives means that you have also registered what the initial option was, what was normal and thus what different could entail. I-330 acknowledges that one state wants all of its citizens to be uniform, to enjoy the way everything is government-sanctioned, to like state control over freedom, to resent the democratic way of life of their ancestors, to be obedient to the point of not being creative, to rationalize things that don't necessarily need to be rationalized, like love and poetry, and she hates it, so she acts accordingly. She plays the piano the way the ancients do, she spends her free time in the one opaque building in the city, she poisons herself with nicotine, she wears a beautiful yellow sundress instead of the mandatory uniform, she gets fake doctor's notes for when she transgresses, she seduces D and thus takes advantage of the irrational parts of love. I could go on. The point is, with her awareness of censorship comes the awareness of alternatives, which, should she pursue, becomes a problem because it means that she's trying to break out of something that is actively happening. So either she breaks out of it and censorship becomes a problem for the state, or she fails and censorship becomes a problem for her because she's now aware that it's actively impeding her goals. Furthermore, when you revolt against censorship, if you fail, you'll be on the receiving end of some good old-fashioned torture. So really, there are three ways that censorship could become a problem 
when you're curious to live life a new way. In any event, censorship suppresses curiosity and imagination. So when a subject becomes aware and interested and curious in censorship itself, the situation becomes meta because censorship is then censoring itself, covering its own tracks to avoid criticism or revolt or publicity. And the result, no matter which one, whether it's down with the government, torture, open and active restriction, etc., it's a problem, and there's nothing a subject can do. Before we finish up the episode, fun fact time, did you know that Yevgeny Zenyatin literally wrote a letter to Joseph Stalin requesting exile? Yeah, and he succeeded. He was exiled not once, but twice. What an icon. Okay, let's finish it up. To be pretty honest, that took a lot longer than I had anticipated, but you know, we took a lot longer to read and process than I had anticipated, so I suppose this is only fair. It only goes to show how complex and nuanced the narrative of the book really is, and if it took me this long to only scrape the surface of one theme of multiple, then that's all the more reason for you to read it yourself and get talking about your ideas. So, what did we talk about today? We explored the theme of censorship, different forms of censorship, namely indoctrination, and then we delved into my thematic statement that censorship is only a problem when its subjects become aware of it. We covered how ignorance is bliss, and how you cannot question or worry or hate something you don't know is happening, and how censorship really sets itself up so that you're stuck in a cycle where you don't know what you don't know and you can't know because the resources you need to reach an epiphany are being withheld. But say somehow you do find out like I330 did, then we talked a bit about curiosity and how it could get you into trouble in the context of a totalitarian government using censorship. You could either be convicted for your curiosities and for investigating into what is being censored, or be hampered in your pursuit of something other than what the government is trying to mandate. Or you could succeed and then be tortured and killed. Or you could succeed and dismantle the dictatorship, but we don't see that happen in we. Either way... A problem with censorship only arises when its subjects become aware, become curious, and become active against it. The crux of today's episode is complicity with censorship is always implied, and if complicity doesn't exist in the dynamic, then the censorship clearly isn't effective and thus gives way to gaps that either threaten the system itself or harm the individuals in the chasms where they fall, where they may learn that everything they've already learned may need relearning. Pretty confusing, but also pretty nifty, huh? So maybe there are things we don't know. Things we'll never know, and things we should know but don't. Maybe our portrayal of censorship has been so extreme in our media and our novels that we can't recognize the little signs of censorship in our day, in real life, happening right now. Maybe we'll die and the universe will do away with humanity and we'll still never be able to know what we didn't know. And that's okay, because censorship is only a problem when we're aware of it. And we're not, but we really ought to be. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Cheryl. Stay open, stay away, stay curious, and stay active.